As a child, I remember being told that monsters don't really exist. But they do though, and in this episode, monsters don't come more evil and twisted than this one. This is the dark and chilling case of James Patterson Smith. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you may be in the world right now. I'm Lloyd, and today you're watching When Evil Follows. For the majority, being a parent is one of the most blessed and meaningful experiences life has to offer, ensuring a solid foundation, safety, and enforcing positivity and understanding, love and strength, and right from wrong, giving everything a child needs to grow and succeed successfully in life. But what happens when you give all of that and more, and some vicious and evil monster worms his way into your child's life without you even knowing? Kellyanne Bates was born into the world on the 18th of May in the year of 1978 at the main Manchester hospital within the UK. She was born to two loving and caring parents, Margaret and Tommy Bates. Margaret was so proud and supportive of her and her two siblings, Andrew and Paul, and all five family members lived together in a cute house in Hatsley in Manchester, England. Margaret would often tell her friends and family that having children was the best thing she had ever done with her life, and would describe her children as being perfect. Growing up it was clear to see that Kellyanne was a happy child who was confident and smart with big dreams of one day becoming a teacher. She was also very mature for her age, and at just age 13 years old, she was intuitive and very headstrong. Kellyanne also enjoyed playing within the senior women's hockey team as the goalkeeper. She got on well with everyone in the team, and she was really enjoying just being a part of that team. And so yeah, many people would say that she was very mature and ahead of her years for her age, and because of this sense of maturity, lots of families in the area would actually trust her to babysit. And, and why not? In the year of 1993, on this particular evening, whilst babysitting for a local family, 14-year-old Kellyanne would meet a 46-year-old man who was friends of the family Kelly was babysitting for. That man was called James Smith. Now, Kellyanne and James Smith would soon begin a statutory rape relationship. However, due to the grooming process, James made it very clear to Kelly that they should probably keep their relationship quiet. And so, for two years, they both kept their relationship a secret. However, as soon as Kellyanne turned 16 and left school, she made the decision to move in with James at his house on Furnifor Road in Gorton. So, who is James Smith? Well, in order for me to explain everything as what we know as truth and fact, we're going to have to come away from the timeline just for a moment. James Patterson Smith, he was born in the year of 1948 in Manchester, England. As a child, he was what some would call a recluse, who struggled to make friends sociably, and his schooling grades were below average. And by the time he was 16, Smith quickly developed a sharp temper, due to having a lower level of self-loathing and social confidence. Eventually, Smith would find love and marry in the year of 1970, although just 10 years later, in 1980, his marriage would come to an end, due to continuous unemployment and violent attacks towards his wife. In fact, these violent attacks towards women would not only continue, but they would also worsen and intensify over time. He would find love again. From the years of 1980 to 1982, Smith was in a committed relationship with a 20-year-old woman. Her name was Tina Watson who he used as a regular kick and punch bag, even subjecting her to severe violent beatings while she was pregnant carrying his child. Tina Watson would eventually find the courage to leave and escape the relationship after Smith actually attempted to drown her in the bath while she was relaxing. Like he actually tried to drown her in the bath while she was listening to the radio and chilling out. He's there, sneaking into the bathroom, trying to, ugh. What an Towards the end of that same year in 1982, Smith would go on to begin a statutory rape relationship 
with a 15-year-old girl named Wendy Motter's head. She, unknowingly, would be the third female victim to suffer horrendous violent abuse at the hands of James Smith. These physical attacks would become much more extreme. This one time, he held Wendy's head under the water in the kitchen sink in an attempt to drown her. So yeah. One proper indecent, foul and extremely dangerous waster of a human being. Which brings us back up to date to the current timeline. Kellyanne, believing she was doing the right thing, she made the decision to move in with Smith at his home on Venerful Road in Gorton. Now, just bear in mind that Kelly had concealed this relationship from her parents for two years. And so when Kelly finally took Smith around to the family home to meet her parents for the first time, they were totally shocked and completely against the idea of their daughter being with a man who was three times her own age. Not only did Margaret not like the huge age gap, but she didn't like him as a person neither. She didn't like the fact that he would interrupt and answer the questions for Kelly in general conversations. She found him to be quite controlling and unable to merge into a conversation in the right way. Now, Margaret tried everything she could in order to get her daughter away from this man. Call it maturity or intuition. But she knew, she just knew, this older man just wasn't right for her Kellyanne. And of course, you know what they say, a mother always knows best. But Kelly didn't listen. She, she didn't want to listen. And she refused to listen to her mother's claims. And the unlikely pair would continue their intimate relationship together. And as far as Kelly was concerned, the conversation was done and over with. Fast forward just six months to the 14th of May, when an argument broke out leading to Kelly moving back into her parents' house. And although the breakup was quite brief, these arguments and breakups would start to become more and more regular. And it was around that time Kelly's parents would begin noticing occurring bruise marks appearing on Kelly's body, mainly her arms and legs. To which Kelly would always explain away as an accident. Oh, you know, I fell down the stairs, I, I, I tripped over the shoes. You know, she would always have some kind of simple excuse. Yeah, the, these excuses, they, they were really weak excuses as well, you know. Um, definitely a reason for a parent to become more concerned at this point. And it was at this time she became increasingly withdrawn as contact with friends and family would slowly stop. And in the December of 1995, she even resigned from her part-time job. In the beginning of the new year in 1996, Margaret and Tommy received cards, supposedly from Kelly, wishing them both a happy anniversary and a birthday card made out to Margaret. And even though the cards were saying the right things, Kellyanne's handwriting looked somewhat different including her normal cute star-shaped signature. Now, somewhat concerned by this, Margaret and Tommy, they decided to take a drive down to the house on Furnival Road in Gorton to see their daughter and to make sure that, you know, everything was okay. But once they arrived at the property and after knocking on the door for around 10 minutes, nobody came to the front door and nobody seemed to be home. It was the same situation for her two brothers as well. They would both catch the bus and make their way down to the property and after knocking on the door for 10-15 minutes, even waiting around outside the house, there was still no sign of Kelly and no sign of Smith anywhere. And this silent treatment, this disappearing act, would only install further worry into the hearts and minds of the Bates family. And it was by now, even the neighbours began asking questions as to the whereabouts of where Kellyanne was. It was just strange. It was as if she disappeared without a trace and without telling anyone. It just wasn't like her character to simply disappear. And the whole situation was just rather worrying and quite odd. Eventually, Kellyanne's disappearance was reported to the police by her family, who were now sickened with worry and stress. The police made a visit to the property. However, just like all the other attempts before, the outcome was exactly the same, with no response given from anybody inside. Now there's no doubt in my mind whatsoever that during the time of the police visits and the family's consistent attempts in making contact with Kelly, Smith was in the house all along and no doubt crouching behind the sofa or hiding out in an upstairs bedroom or something. And the reason why I'm saying this is quite simple. 
He knew it was only a matter of time before the police would eventually come crashing in through that front door, one way or another. And wow, what a coincidence, because on that same day, on the 16th of April in the year of 1996, the police received a phone call from Smith, who told the police that he had accidentally drowned his girlfriend in the bath. However, by the time the police arrived at the house, they found blood trails and blood splatter throughout each room within the property. And then they discovered Kelly's naked body in the bedroom. It soon became very clear that this wasn't an accidental death at all. Now, Kelly did indeed drown in the bath, but only after enduring weeks and weeks of torture at the hands of James Smith. Kelly's little body was found with over 150 injuries in total. She had been tied up with rope and bound with ligatory around her neck. She had serious burns on the insides of her legs and belly, a fractured arm with deep, deep, multiple stab wounds from knives and scissors and even dinner forks. Both of her hands were crushed and she had deep stab wounds inside her mouth. Her hairline was partially scalped and then pulled right away from her forehead. And if that wasn't bad enough, she was also found with two empty eye sockets. Smith was immediately arrested at his home under the suspicion of first degree murder and he was taken to the Manchester police station where he was detained and interviewed and it was during police interrogation Smith completely denied murdering Kelly. Yeah, he actually told the police that Kelly had inflicted these damaging wounds to herself in order to make him look bad. And so he kept her as hostage within the house until her wounds had healed. However, this Bolognese statement would soon change as police forensic and the coroner's report both concluded the same outcome both stating that the wounds to Kelly's body were the worst that they have ever seen. These brutal cuts and wounds and unspeakable damage done to Kelly's body still haunt the minds of both professionals to this very day. The coroner and police forensic said, I'll put this bluntly, there's absolutely no way she could have done this to herself whilst controlling the pain over an extended amount of time, that time being at least four weeks. There was just no way that she could have done this to herself. It was simply impossible. The coroner stated Kelly had suffered all of these injuries in the last four weeks of her life, leading to her death before finally being dragged along the bathroom floor and then being drowned in the bathtub. Smith was then held indefinitely at the Manchester prison until his court hearing. And on the 12th and 19th of November, in the year of 1997, Smith appeared on the dock in the Manchester Crown Court, accused of first degree murder. Smith would then go on to change his bullshit story once again and told the judge and jury that Kelly had prompted him into making these crimes because she called him names and taunted him and egged him on into committing murder. Fortunately, it only took just less than an hour to find him guilty and James Patterson Smith was sentenced to serve a full lifetime in prison with the minimum of 20 years to serve behind bars. It's just crazy to think that each time a family member was knocking on that front door to make contact with Kelly, she was actually being held inside that house and being tortured for four weeks. James Patterson Smith, he still remains behind bars to this very day. <laughs> Hello there, and thank you for watching another episode of When Evil Follows. As always, if you have enjoyed this case, then please hit the like button and subscribe to the channel. Your support and subscribing to the channel means the world to us and ensures that we can continue making shocking and great videos just like this one. So what do you think to this case? Do you believe Smith's claims? Let me know your thoughts about this case in the comment section below. And until next time, please stay safe and I'll see you again the next time when evil follows. Bye.